All right, so we're going to get started. And uh, today's session is going to be around um, setting up the development environment. And um, I've seen that a lot of people find it uh, like there's a lot of different options for um, doing the development work. And um, today I want to kind of show you a very simple way to set it all up and um, make sure that you kind of understand how things fit together. So we're going to look a little bit under the hood and uh, we're also going to look at um, how we can put together uh, different distinct tools uh, and uh, assemble basically a development environment out of those tools. So um, there's a few basic things that you need in order to uh, do development work for uh, microcontrollers and microprocessors. And um, the most uh, important thing is that you need to be able to compile things uh, for your target. And typically uh, this is done using uh, what we call a tool chain. And um, then once you have uh, built your program for the target, you need to flash the program on the target. And um, that you do using a special uh, device that we call a uh, JTAG adapter, which basically connects to the, uh, to the chip and um, uh, allows you to, to run uh, debug commands uh, on the microcontroller uh, to uh, set registers, to uh, write to flash, and um, to basically um, even set breakpoints uh, as you are um, navigating the program in the debugger. So uh, you, need, uh, you need to have a tool chain, you need to have a JTAG, JTAG adapter, and uh, you need to have uh, some, some place to write your code basically. And does it matter what IDE you use? Well, it doesn't actually matter. So uh, you can pick any IDE that you feel comfortable with. You can use VS code, you can use um, any other text editor uh, or any other tool that basically allows you to navigate text and edit text. And as long as the tool is, as long as you feel comfortable with the tool and uh, you can navigate uh, structured text, which all code is basically, um, that tool is gonna work as a programming editor. So you don't need to uh, have a specific uh, IDE or uh, you don't need to look for a specific IDE or uh, a specific uh, tool to write your code. You can write your code in um, any one of the tools that, that are available out there. And a lot of the development work uh, that's been done on Linux uh, has always uh, historically been done in using editors like Emacs and Vim. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of people that use those editors still. Um, the learning curve can be a little bit, um, it, they do have a little bit of a learning cur curve when you uh, start using them, but um, when you learn uh, how they work, uh, they're actually pretty powerful. So we're going to go uh, a little bit into that as well and sort of uh, I'll show you how to uh, configure uh, or basically like basic tools that you need uh, in those editors in order to make them uh, useful for uh, you know uh, basic development work. And then you can obviously extend them with uh, lots of different plugins that are available out there um, that other people have written over the years. So um, when it comes to debugging uh, what what uh, what we use to uh, to flash the firmware is called the debug probe, and uh, for STM32 uh, we have a new product uh, that is available right now, which is called uh, ST-Link V3, uh, which is a replacement of ST-Link V2. And um, one of the good things about V3 is that it actually includes uh, a UART. Actually, later versions of V2 have included a UART as well. But uh, in previous version of ST-Link, uh, you actually needed to have a separate adapter for the UART. So, uh, so in order to see sort of the, uh, the text or the deb debug messages from the microcontroller. And that was a little bit cumbersome, but uh, with the V3, you have the UART uh, already available on this uh, probe itself. So you can just connect it uh, to your board that you are working with and you will have access to all of the debug functionality as well as the console functionality um, from the micro microcontroller. And uh, if you want to have a probe that supports uh, many different connections, uh, many different uh, chips uh, as well, then you can use LPC Link V2, which is a little bit more complex uh, debug probe. But they basically uh, fulfill the same function, which is essentially letting you connect to the chip uh, or, or what we call a serial uh, debugging interface. Actually, I'm going to also share this with you. So you can find you can find the link to this document now in the chat box, uh, so you can see the whole the whole document. 
So the debug probe uh, lets you basically um, connect to the chip over the serial interface. And um, uh, then you can use uh, a traditional debugger uh, to uh, debug your program. And how does that work? Like, how, do, how does it actually work to debug things on the microcontroller? Uh, it actually works in the, exactly the same way as on the on the PC, except that when you're debugging on the PC, uh, you are basically connecting to the to the executable, or you're ex inspecting the debugger uh, inspects the memory of the executable, and uh, it uh, shows you the information about the CPU registers, and it can actually insert a code into um, into the running program. Uh, and um, by doing so, insert breakpoints in, in the code and affect the execution of the of the program. But on a on a chip, it's um, it's kind of the same, but it's also a little bit different. Uh, on the chip, you can't easily modify the code of the running program because it can be executing from Flash, for example. And so on the chip, you have uh, instead of what is called hardware breakpoints and uh, hardware features that are available in in hardware on the chip, but which basically fulfills the same functionality. Uh, to, to give the debugger the information that it needs uh, in order to show you uh, the state of the running program. And so uh, when, when you're connected through this through the probe, uh, when you're connected with GDB, uh, you basically uh, can do anything on the chip. So you can dump memory, you can dump buffers, you can uh, dump variables, you can set uh, breakpoints in code, you can even uh, create, uh, as we discussed in the, one of the previous sessions, you can create uh, scripts for the debugger that run uh, and uh, that monitor, for example, a breakpoint and execute uh, a number of debugger commands uh, when that breakpoint is hit. So every time the code is running and it hits a breakpoint, you can actually execute uh, debugger commands uh, at that trigger and uh, do things like, for example, dump a variable repeatedly. Uh, into a file um, by simply appending the, the data of the variable. So you can use um, append memory command in, in GDB to, to do that. And that, that's really powerful. Uh, and um, the, the, the main debugger that, uh, that is used underneath a lot of these um, IDE tools that, that you find out there is basically GDB. So a lot of the IDE tools uh, just simply connect to the GDB debugger and um, uh, the GDB uh, then connects to a open OCD or a similar tool uh, that actually uh, maintains the connection through this uh, through this debug probe to the chip. So um, open OCD is a tool that is uh, designed for um, connecting through one of these adapters to the chip and then exposing a GDB uh, compatible server uh, on the local computer, which GDB can then connect to. So uh, you would you would typically um, if if you do this over a terminal you would basically uh, do something like this so you would connect uh, you would use Open OCD to connect uh, to your debug probe and then you would do a GDB um, server uh, you, you would basically uh, I actually have a, a longer command farther down in this doc but you will first use Open uh, Open OCD to uh, create a GDB socket and then you would you would connect um, to the GDB socket uh, using GDB, uh, using a command in GDB. And then you would supply a port that you have um, that you've given to open OCD. And uh, this is how GDB or the debugger uh, is able to inspect memory on the chip. So, so you, you basically establish this connection and then uh, through OpenOCD, uh, the debugger can communicate with uh, the chip in a, in a very generic way. So um, it is OpenOCD that essentially provides the interface for all of these different chips that, that are out there, uh, whether it's an STM32 or an LPC or a Texas Instruments or some other chip. Uh, OpenOCD has support for all of them, and then it provides a standard interface out to a GDB, uh, and um, GDB can connect to that interface and, and basically inspect the contents of the chip. But uh, you can't use just any GDB. You need to have a GDB that supports your architecture. So GDB does care about the architecture of the chip, and the architecture is basically whether it's an ARM chip or a Intel chip, or if it's a 
um, a MIPS chip, uh, GDB needs to have that support built in. And so what we have uh, today is uh, something called GDB multi-arc, uh, which supports a number of different architectures. Uh, and uh, you can use GDB multi-arc when you're working with, uh, with uh, the uh, debug probes, basically. Uh, and uh, and it will work with ARM. And it will work with um, many different chips that uh, that are that have been compiled in into the single executable. So if you if you simply run uh, GDB as uh, as a normal GDB command, you would see the GDB. You would run the GDB that is designed for debugging programs that are running on your computer. Uh, when you want to debug uh, a program that's been compiled for ARM, you need to use a GDB multi arc in order to um, be able to see the ARM. Um, assembly code and in order for GDB to be able to understand the ARM assembly that is running on the chip, uh, it needs to have that support basically built in. Uh, and uh, obviously you need a board as well to, uh, to do uh, the development work. And um, development boards are designed for that. Uh, so you can easily uh, test your code on the chip. But what a lot of development boards um, lack is um, the external devices that, that you would use uh, in your product. So if you're designing a product, uh, a development board can kind of help you, but then you need to uh, find different modules and uh, different evaluation boards that you can then connect to the development board and um, be able to test different different products. Uh, so um, uh, oftentimes, if, if you're just uh, developing like application logic, you can do that uh, on the computer and uh, test that on the computer without having to actually run it on the, on the real chip. But uh, if, if you, uh, like nowadays, it's actually easy to create your own PCBs. So you can use KiCad or um, Eagle or any other uh, PCB creation tool and just create your own PCBs. And um, uh, STM32 chips are very good for that because they don't require that many external components to actually work. So um, uh, if, if you want to, like, if you want to, you can add an external crystal for the RTC to get really good RTC precision. But uh, the chip is designed to kind of work with minimal external components. So it's possible to build simple like test boards that you can then put sensors on and, uh, and use as evaluation boards. So, um, so the, like in simple terms, if, if you're just like, if, if you're starting out and you want to like set up your development environment, uh, you need, you need those basic tools and those basic tools basically do everything that, that you can think of, um, that you want to do with, with your, with your chip. Uh, and then a lot of the IDE tools are just connecting to those basic tools like open OC, uh, GDB and open OCD. So the, the IDEs are just there to sort of give you an interface uh, to those tools. But if you have access to those, uh, to those lower level tools, you can typically do just fine um, and, and get things done. Um, like obviously it, it, it can be helpful to have IDE help to visualize things, but uh, as long as there is support in those lower level tools, uh, you can still uh, get the firmware on the chip and you can still do development work and you can still uh, accomplish things and debug things. Uh, and so um, the most important thing is to kind of get those uh, lower level tools working. Um, and uh, it's easy to, um, to search for support uh, in these tools because it's, they are command line tools. And so all of their documentation basically contains command line options that are um, that typically include the name of your chip that you're using. So uh, just searching for, for example, open OCD support for STM32 F4, and you will find a lot of F4 content. And so you can basically just insert whatever architecture you're using and see if there is uh, open OCD support for that architecture. And if there is, then you can debug it. So uh, you don't need to uh, like think about anything else. Um, uh, like, do I need a specific ID to be able to debug it? Uh, as long as OpenOCD supports that, that architecture uh, and you have a debug probe that is able to connect to your board, uh, then, you can, then you can use it and you can flash it and you can uh, extract firmware from it and you can debug it and you can uh, read registers on it and you can do anything uh, basically that you can think of um, in terms of debugging uh, through the standard GDB interface. Uh, and then from there on, like you can you can start thinking like what what other features do I need? Maybe I need some vis visualization for some uh, something that I'm doing. And then from there from there you can start using uh, IDE tools that uh, give you th those features. Uh, but uh, don't don't go around and like think um, 
uh, trying to to decide which um, like which uh, uh, product to choose or which chip to choose or which um, IDE to choose. Um, just focus on figuring out whether there is just the support for uh, connecting to the chip using uh, GDB, and then if that works, then you can you can basically you're okay. Um, and then you can just pick uh, whatever tool that works for you to write the code itself. So um, one of the one of the things, um, let's see. Uh, so we have, I do I do have a few links here if you want to check them out. Those uh, links are pretty good. Uh, here's a link for uh, GDB advanced GDB usage that mentions a lot of uh, GDB specific commands that you can that you can use to inspect memory and uh, things like that. But one of the things uh, that I also add today is uh, a GDB init script that gives you a very nice interface to GDB, uh, which looks like this. So this is a lot better than just the command line that you typically see when you just run GDB as normal. Uh, so this gives you kind of like all the data that you need and in, including where you are in the code and things like that. So, uh, and th this, this is, uh, this works by reading the elf file. So it's, it's like, it's not dependent on what IDE you use to write the program. It's basically just using all the information, all the debug information that's available. Uh, when you uh, start GDB with that particular executable file and you connect to your target, and then you can basically start debugging uh, and stepping through the program and doing it all the typical things that, that you would do uh, while, while you're debugging. Um, but now we get to the, to the next point. And it's, uh, it's the point of like, how much code can you reuse uh, from what is already available out there? And this is a very important thing to consider because um, when, when your system gets to any, uh, anything more complex than like for example, blinking a LED, uh, you start getting into a situation where there's a lot of code that you need to uh, either write yourself or uh, reuse. And um, it's always better to reuse code. Um, we all know that and it's, it's the obvious thing, but um, what code do we actually reuse? And so um, there's a lot of different systems out there uh, that have been put together. Uh, they typically go under the name of Artos. So there's like different flavors of different artos out there. Um, but um, what you want to look at is uh, the, the kind of the general uh, cleanliness of the code. And um, this is very apparent when you start looking into a project and uh, you start sort of looking, how is this software actually designed? Is it easy to, um, to add a new driver to it? Is it easy to reuse things within the, the project itself? Is it easy to, like, does it have all the necessary uh, data types, like the basic data types. Can I, can I create lists with uh, like, is there, is there a way to create like uh, lists uh, that are specific to this, to the system uh, and the, the, that are kind of like other standard primitives for different data structures uh, in that system. And all those things are, are very good to have. So you're kind of looking for a library because you're working on a microcontroller, you can't just use any library. Like you can't just compile a library that's designed for, um, uh, for running on the PC and expect it to work on the microcontroller. It does require uh, a little bit of a special way of writing the code. Like for example, avoiding um, dynamic allocation that, that is happening all the time. Like you don't want to allocate uh, things all the time. And a lot of libraries do that. So a lot of libraries allocate a lot of memory, then they free a lot of memory. Uh, and if you have very little memory, you can't afford to do that. So um, when it comes to like integrating libraries, uh, it is a process that requires you to look through the code. So you have to go into the library code and, and look like, what is this library doing? How is it implemented? And how can we integrate it into our project? So you want to avoid doing that as much as possible. And uh, for uh, embedded, like, microcontroller-based embedded systems for the smaller chips uh, that, that don't run a full, a full system, uh, what, what you're looking for is essentially uh, an environment where you can start developing your software as quickly as possible uh, while still reusing as much of the code as possible that's already been done by other people. And um, the environment that, um, that I've been using is uh, the Zephyr environment. You're familiar with that. And Zephyr is a good example of that. So uh, Zephyr is uh, also going under the name of Artos, but uh, it's actually an environment. It's a development environment uh, in terms of like the functionality that has been added to the code base. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of primitives, a lot of data structures, a lot of uh, things that have already been implemented for you. 
and you can use them as uh, a library. Uh, and the biggest benefit of that is that uh, you, you're kind of, um, you have all of these things already there and uh, you don't need to re-implement them yourself. Um, and uh, they are all uh, designed to fit together. So if you're using something that is, um, if you're using the operating system primitives directly, uh, you can just, um, you know, you, you basically use slightly different names um, than you would do on the PC, but the functionality is implemented in a very similar way. So if you're using a semaphore, it's going to be called in Zephyr K sem, and uh, you know, in on on a PC, you'd use a P thread library, for example, to interact with with semaphores. But the principles are uh, the same, and those are the kind of things that you don't want to be implementing yourself. So if you're if you're looking into like uh, how do I start with microcontrollers and what do I do next, like once I have the development environment installed, uh, the, the the best thing you can do is to start with a system that's already been developed uh, and that that you can use in your commercial product, uh, like if. The, the license of the of the system, the license of the source code is compatible with with commercial um, with your commercial product and the license of your commercial product, and and that's that's the basic requirement. And from there, you just kind of look at what uh, what can you reuse and and what can you avoid implementing yourself. So. Um, so using an ARTA system is extremely uh, big time saver. It's it's very um, very good next step to take after um, having all the basic stuff set up. And so um, the the rest of this tutorial, um, I'll show you kind of a quick introduction on how to get started with the Zephyr system. Uh, and the Zephyr system implements uh, all of these things for you. So it it has. Um, it kind of integrates libraries. So um, it does have to take libraries uh, from the, the bigger ecosystem out there. Uh, for example, Arduino libraries, there's a lot of Arduino libraries for a lot of these things. And uh, when you have like, when you have a firmware project, you have to essentially take those libraries into the main code base and then compile them with the same flags as you're compiling all the other code and also clean those libraries up. So that's what kind of Zephyr is doing. Uh, gradually, uh, it kind of takes in a library. Like, for example, a good example is uh, LVM2M, L LWM2M. It's a library for machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication. And uh, this library has been brought into the project, cleaned up, and it's kind of evolving now with the project. And so the project grows by kind of adapting different um, lower level uh, stacks into it, and then um, cleaning them up and making them part of the project. And that's one of the that's that's a very big benefit as well because otherwise you would have to be doing that yourself uh, and um, taking in an arduino library is not very simple if you're starting from scratch because now you have to either use the arduino the other arduino libraries or you have to uh, take the arduino library rewrite it uh, to make it uh, to make it fit into your project and um, one of the experiences that, that i've had with zephyr and the reasons i like it so much is because it's it's a very clean system and um, it's uh, it's written very well. Uh, the core itself is written very well. Uh, some libraries that are that are being used uh, that have, they've been pulled from outside. They don't have a very good quality of the code, but the the core system is very well designed, and and that is that that is very uh, that is a very good benefit. Uh, that is one of the most important things to to consider when you are picking like what system should I choose. It has to be well designed and it has to be easy to reuse things and it has to be easy to uh, expand the system itself and add new components that can then be reused across uh, different boards and different um, uh, hardware architectures. Uh, and uh, this system has made it easy to do that. Um, and it's done with uh, abstract interfaces. There is uh, a whole driver model uh, that, that you can use to implement a standard driver interfaces uh, that can then be used by other drivers. So that's really powerful. Uh, and I've made a video before uh, on this subject. You can find it here. Uh, this is a more detailed video on how to actually set it all up. Uh, but uh, if you're working on Windows, and you want to use a system like Zephyr, for example. Uh, Zephyr is using uh, Linux scripts to to compile everything, and so there's a lot of uh, like you often use things like CMake and sometimes even Make and and even like Bash commands and um, common line tools that are common to Linux. So it's kind of it kind of makes sense to uh, to have a Linux environment in Windows, and. Um, 
Microsoft has been, has been working a lot on that topic uh, by implementing what they call the Microsoft Windows subsystem for Linux uh, that implements a Linux virtualization on Windows. So you can run a Linux kernel on Windows uh, and have a terminal that is uh, a Linux terminal, basically. Uh, and um, you can run a, a real Linux kernel virtualized and you will have access to all of the bash tools and it's completely integrated with Windows. So if you are working on Windows, if you don't want to like uh, transition to uh, just using Ubuntu, for example, uh, you can actually uh, install um, VSL on Windows and um, you can then install Ubuntu from uh, the, the Windows store and directly uh, get the Ubuntu running as a, as a terminal window on Windows. Uh, so that's very practical. And that's something that gives you access to all of the standard Linux tools. So you can use apt, you can install packages using apt, uh, and they will just end up in this Linux part of your system. And uh, this Linux part has access to all the other things on your system. So it has access to your normal Windows drives and uh, you can do basically anything uh, that you would, uh, you can access anything that you uh, can access on Windows, um, but through the Linux interface. So, so that's really um, that's really useful if you are using Windows. And if you're using Ubuntu, you just uh, you know use Linux, and then you continue with uh, the next steps that I described here. So, uh, when it comes to installing this, so what you want to do now is basically install this basic uh, programming environment so that you can have uh, the Zephyr system uh, compilable into a firmware, so you can start building your application on top of it. And the tutorial that I, that I have here, that I've linked in this uh, video here, it kind of shows you how to, uh, how to go through the process of setting up the, the basic directory structure uh, of your application and uh, uh, the necessary uh, files like the CMake file and the project configuration file. Uh, so it goes into detail about that. So I'm not going to cover it uh, today. But um, I'm going to give you a quick um, top-down overview of what, what is involved in setting it all up. So first, first of all, you need a few tools uh, to be able to compile and build uh, the, the Zephyr firmware. And so you install them here. This is just basically a copy paste uh, thing from the Zephyr documentation. Uh, these are prerequisites, the basic prerequisites. And then you install a tool called West. Uh, and uh, West is a tool used for uh, easy building of the, of the firmware. So you can just run uh, West build and it will basically build your firmware. And uh, you can use, uh, like underneath, West is actually using CMake. And you can use CMake, CMake uh, yourself uh, manually, but it's just more things to type. So it's, it's just uh, more uh, flags to give to CMake. Uh, when you can just use West and it kind of automates the whole process for you. So with West, you can create different targets uh, for your uh, firmware. For example, you can compile one firmware with debugging information enabled, which would be a separate project file. Uh, and you can have another one with debugging disabled, which would be like a release um, uh, version of your, of your firmware. And uh, the, the project file that contains the configuration is basically the, the configuration file that is output with uh, using menu config. So uh, the Zephyr system uses menu config and it's a tool used for configuring different options of the system. So uh, the output file basically looks like a, like a series of uh, config lines. So it's like config, um, let's see, SPI, yes. And that basically enables SPI uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the source code of, of Zephyr. So uh, then you would have SPI STM32 that would enable the driver for STM32 and so on. Uh, so uh, with West, you can you can easily just build uh, firmware from those configuration files, and uh, the output of, of that uh, compilation process is then an ELF executable, which you can pass directly to GDB um, and connect to your target. Like you can first flash it to your target, obviously, uh, but then you can just uh, uh, pass it to GDB, and then connect GDB uh, to the GDB socket that OpenOCD has uh, open and listening for, for GDB connections. And then uh, through that, you, you basically connect to the, to the target and then you can uh, synchronize the, the state of the target with the uh, debugging information that you have within GDB. So, um, so once you've installed West, you're basically ready to go in terms of command line tools. And on top of that, you can then add any other tools uh, that you want to use for actually writing the software. So those tools would be basically things like um, code fold, like, you know, different tools for navigating the source code, uh, anything, anything that simplifies the process of actually writing the code. 
but those things are kind of different from the from the things that are actually needed to to build the software so those things are just uh, something that you pick based on what 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 will make your life easier uh, but uh, as long as as long as you have those uh, lower level command to uh, command line tools uh, in place and working, uh, you're ready to go. So uh, beyond that, is everything is just a bonus. Um, and uh, Zephyr also gives you uh, so there is a, there's a pre-compiled Zephyr SDK, and the SDK is basically a tool chain. So the tool chain is something that I didn't mention yet uh, in detail, but the tool chain is basically the GCC compiler, uh, which is compiled to build executables for a particular target. So if you have a ARM chip and you want to build executables uh, for the for the ARM ARM platform, then you need to have a GDB that uh, or GCC compiler uh, that is uh, designed to generate code for that platform, and it's called a cross compiler. And so uh, Zephyr. SDK comes with a bunch of these compilers already included. So it's not just ARM, it's it's everything. So everything that's supported by Zephyr, obviously, but it's it's a lot of different compilers. And the, you, you get basically access to all of them when you install the SDK and, and you can start using them to build uh, software for many different platforms. Uh, and this process is almost completely transparent to you. Uh, so it's, it's a very simple way to just get started quickly uh, and, um, and start actually building your application software. So you can install the, the SDK using instructions here, or you can also go to the Zephyr documentation and, uh, and follow the instructions there. Uh, but this is basically a, a simplification of the instructions that you would find in the official documentation. Uh, one, one, cool, uh, one cool command that you can use when you're uh, navigating, like uh, writing scripts that go into a directory, you can use like push D, which uh, pushes a directory and then navigates into the directory. So everything after push D is, is going to be running in that directory. And then you can just use pop D to pop that previously pushed directory. So you get back to where you were before. Uh, that's a useful trick for, uh, for writing bash scripts uh, that um, go into a directory, do a bunch of things, and then go back. Um, now, if you're using Terminal and you want to kind of uh, use uh, terminal-based tools, uh, there's a lot of powerful tools in Linux for uh, coding inside the terminal environment entirely. Uh, and one of the tools that I like a lot is called Tmux. And uh, this is basically uh, a tool that allows you to um, create different windows within your, your terminal window. So you can have different tabs uh, in your main terminal uh, and you can easily navigate between them. So you can have a tab for your uh, Vim editor or you can have a tab for uh, a bash terminal or you can have a tab for flashing the chip. Or you, and, and, and then you can basically navigate those tabs by just pressing uh, short codes on the keyboard. So that's really um, practical. Uh, and uh, it's a very fast way to, uh, to have multiple terminals open uh, and being able to navigate between them easily. And I've also provided you here with a Tmux config, uh, which uh, gives you a simple navigation between the terminal windows. So this navigation uh, follows the, the Vim pattern of uh, control. Uh, first, you have to always um, start each command that you give to Tmux using control A, because otherwise, uh, you know, it needs to be able to pass the, the key combinations to the program that's running in Tmax. So uh, control A basically puts, uh, sends the next uh, key combination to Tmax and not to the program that's running inside the Tmax. Uh, so uh, it's control A uh, and then HGKL to move around and control A, uh, control C to create a new uh, terminal window. Uh, so, so, so you can start another application in it. Uh, and um, inside the terminal, uh, you can use the Vim editor uh, to edit code. Now, the default Vim editor is uh, kind of difficult to use because you don't have access to like the, the tree of um, all the files that you have in your project. Uh, so you can use something that's called uh, nerd tree uh, to, um, to get this uh, functionality of uh, being able to see all the files and navigate it as a directory tree on the, on the left, left hand side. So that's one of the basic plugins that I really recommend everyone to, uh, to get into Vim. Uh, and um, once, uh, so Vim has, uh, there is instructions on how to um, install plugins in Vim. Uh, and uh, Vim has a plugin manager that is, uh, it actually has several different plugin managers, but one of the plugin managers is called Pathogen. Uh, so you can 
here's instructions how to install pathogen and then you can basically install uh, nerd tree uh, using uh, the pathogen package manager um, so um, uh, definitely look it up go to uh, their github page nerd tree i haven't included it here but that's basically because i forgot uh, so another thing about a vim is um, that I provide also is this vim rc file so uh, this this is a basically like a bunch of Vim commands that that I've uh, put together. But I think this this settings make sense for me. So you can obviously uh, edit it to your own liking. Uh, but what this does is uh, it basically saves the session that you are navigating right now. So if you have a file open and let's say you then close Vim completely and uh, you start it again later, uh, it's going to navigate to that file. And it's basically going to navigate to that line where you were before. So it, it saves the session uh, and then restarts it. And um, you can script Vim in any way you like. Um, and I also set the sort of the default size of this uh, left pane to um, 40 characters, because for me, that works, that works well. And uh, here are some tab settings as well. And uh, also, uh, I use Control N to, to toggle the the sidebar uh, with the with the file navigator, uh, but uh, so Vim Vim is a very simple editor, but it's also very um, powerful. Like it has uh, all of the syntax highlighting for all of the different file types, and uh, it's very easy to navigate the code inside the editor once you learn a few simple um, things about about the editor, like how to use the editor. And one of the things you can actually do is um, you can go to Vim Adventures. Uh, com uh, actually let's see vimadventures.com and uh, this is a game that you have to play by learning vim so the only way to play this game is to is to understand the vim uh, key bindings and uh, the vim a lot of different like more complex commands uh, in vim so in order to kill monsters in this game you have to actually uh, know vim commands uh, and you have to use them effectively uh, to complete the levels. And the levels get progressively more complex. So as you go through this game, uh, you learn a lot about, about using the Vim editor for uh, editing text. And uh, another uh, editor that a lot of people use is Emacs. Uh, personally, I find, uh, I, I've always liked the, the way that Vim works. So um, I like Emacs configured in the Vim mode. Uh, where uh, all the key bindings are kind of the same as the Vim key bindings. Uh, and you can do that by basically installing the, the Doom Emacs mod, which uh, re reconfigures Emacs to, to use Vim key bindings. And uh, for the GDB, uh, we have this, this script uh, that gives you um, a more enhanced GDB. So um, it basically gives you all the information about like everything um, available on, on the same panel. So you can use this as well. And this, this will work for any architecture. So as long as you have an architecture that's supported by your GDB, uh, you just download this GDB init script. And uh, it has all of the, like you put this into your home folder. Uh, so when you run this, uh, this command here, if you run this command as it is, it's gonna put this into your home directory and then GDB will automatically load this, uh, this script uh, when it starts. Uh, so uh, it gives you lots of different uh, interesting uh, things and information uh, on, uh, like easily available, easily visible to you. So uh, that's that's it for today. And uh, this is uh, like this is this is literally all you need in order to uh, build applications for embedded systems. Uh, so um, just get started and. Uh, get going. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can, um, I'm going to make sure that you can unmute yourselves. And uh, then we can have a short question time. Hello, Steve. Hello, Martin. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Fine. I, I just got, I just got some real board uh, here that I've been playing with. Um, Low power uh, Fidex stuff. I'm fascinated by it. I think it's pretty cool. What have you? Um, 
Yes, I have a question regarding the ST-Link version three. Uh, you say that it include a UART already on the um, debugging probe. Uh, does UART is S4 or is a UART UART? Um, I think it's like, do you mean like if it has flow control? Okay. I haven't checked if it has flow control. Okay. But it probably does. Um, you could check the data sheet. Okay, okay. I will check because I was, I didn't know that there is a new version, version three already. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I'm missing up. Yeah. Okay. I will check out. Right. Um, so another question, G, uh, GDDB uh, debugger, you say, so we have a different version, which one for ARM and different architecture. Uh, so uh, Zephyr support already risk vu architecture? Uh, risk, risk, risk five, you mean? Yes, risk five, yeah, risk yeah. five, yeah. Yeah, as okay. far as I'm aware, I, I, I think it, yeah, there's a lot of work being done on it. Uh, I don't okay. know how well it supports it. Uh, uh -huh. I never used Risk Five, but um, I've been talking to some people that that are working on it, and uh, okay. there seems to be work being done. Okay, okay, perfect. I don't know that much. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, like GDB, before we used to have like different GDB um, compilations. Like you would have. Uh, ARM non EABI GDB uh, for mm. ARM. But uh, now uh, in the latest uh, packages of Ubuntu, uh, it's basically GDB multi arc that basically supports all of the architectures. And uh, a question about the uh, debugging integration with the uh, development environment. Example, yeah. So if I've in place uh, uh, Eclipse setup with the uh, Open OCD and uh, GDB debugger. And suppose we are using SC uh, M32 microcontroller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a process to automatize it. When I compile, I can deploy directly on the microcontroller. And at the same time, I can start debugging with breakpoint. Is that possible uh, to yeah, speed up this? Have have you tried uh, using uh, that kind of setup with with uh, ST Link that you're using today? No, for now I'm not using Zephyr. So I was curious if it's possible to automatize. You know, if you yeah, if in case you are using um, uh, a normal setup using like a Kube uh, STM Kube uh, IDE, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, you can just debug it, the firmware, and automatically it's going to uh, flash the firmware and it start the debugging section with a breakpoint for you. Uh, is that process possible with a Zephyr 2? So I can automate this process directly. So like a, a developer just click, it compile, it flash it, and uh, it start the firmware, and then it stop where you put your breakpoint, something like this. Yeah, I mean that's that's not dependent on Zephyr. Uh, it's not, that's that's dependent on on the setup of the ID. Yeah, the setup basically. Okay, okay, okay. So so um, if um, so when when you normally when you normally start the debugger, it would just have a default breakpoint on uh, the entry point of the yeah, in, yes. and that would be the reset vector. So yeah. um, that that is not dependent on like what system you use it's still going to be the reset vector and then you continue just stepping your through the source code um and debug as normal okay 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 thank you i don't, I don't know if uh, omkar is able to unmute himself uh so go ahead steve so i can tell you yeah uh some uh, information about specific regarding the setup that's involved with the uh, uh, zephyr yeah mm -hmm. uh but first, I want to I want to watch the video link you provide, so where there is a more specific detail, and uh, try to set up the, the the system up the development, and then uh, in this case, then I can get some more picture. Then uh, probably I will come back to you with uh, in the next section next week with some uh, extra question. Yeah, but first, of course, I need to watch the video. You know, yeah, so. 
Yeah, because uh, because a lot of the configuration is done in text files. Uh, so you configure you configure it the same way as you would configure a CMake based build process. And so it's it's not so much dependent on uh, project settings in an IDE, like because I, I think that what you are kind of what you're kind of saying is that you want to know how how the configuration is being done. Uh, like you're familiar with Cube uh, Cube MX and uh, you're familiar with Eclipse, and you're wondering sort of how is that going to work with Zephyr? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. And and so in Zephyr, it's uh, it's all done using the CMake build system, which is kind of placed, uh, which is entirely placed in text files, and um, you're you're basically configuring the build process uh, through the CMake uh, text files, which are the CMake configuration files, and they're all in Git in in your project Git repository. Uh, so they're not. Um, like they're not part of uh, the IDE configuration; they're part of the build process configuration. And okay. the tool called CMake uh, mm -hmm. actually executes the build process un un under the hood. So when you run West, for example, West is a higher level tool. Uh, when you when you run West, it it actually calls CMake, and uh, CMake then compiles the program mm -hmm. uh, based on all of these configuration files uh, that are uh, spread out through the throughout the system, and including your application as well. So your application would include uh, a a tiny CMake file that will just point to your source uh, source files, any libraries that that your application is using, uh, and any uh, sort of external source code that you want to include in your application. Uh, you can configure that in the CMake files, and then from there, uh, the the build system will just compile everything and link it into this single executable, which you then just flash to the uh, to the target. So that video will explain to you a lot of that. So I go into a lot of detail on that in, in that video. So definitely okay, okay. Out. Hello. Hello, Patrick. Uh, hi, Martin. Sorry for being late. I have a question to this uh, record. This will be available all available on YouTube or not? I've, I've seen your, your question. Um, ah. I, I can send you a link. Oh, thank you. W would be nice. Yeah. So uh, that's it for today, uh, guys. And you can always um, reach me over Discord or email. My email is also in the in the document uh, at the bottom of the document. So I'll see everyone next week and um, have a great week. Bye -bye. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Thank Thanks. You too. Ciao.